Okay, I'm recording. All right, so first question would be, during the time you represented Brian Koberger in Pennsylvania, did he reveal anything to you that the public or the police don't already know at this point? When I spoke to Brian uh, about the case, I made it quite clear that I was only his attorney for the extradition proceeding. So we never spoke about any of the facts or circumstances surrounding the actual alleged crime itself. Gotcha. So you're essentially just as much in the dark as the rest of us when it comes to any connection he might have had to these students or a possible motive if he did commit the crime. I'm Correct. I wanted to view the case objectively myself also. Uh, so I was working in the blind because I didn't have the update for probable cause. So I wouldn't even be able to discuss anything with him, even if he relayed inf any information to me. Gotcha. Uh, so you said before that he helped you craft the statement that you made on his behalf after his arrest. What was his opinion on the statement? What did he want to make sure was, was said or was included? I think the most important part was the uh, exoneration part. He believed that he would be exonerated, uh, which to me implicitly meant that he was innocent of the crimes uh, so that obviously there wouldn't be either enough evidence or, or he was going to be found innocent of the crimes. Throughout your interactions with him, how would you describe his demeanor? When I was speaking with Mr. Koberger, he was very calm. He was aware of the serious nature uh, of what was going on. Uh, he was easy to talk to. I've said multiple times that he's very intelligent, uh, which might make it easier for me to, to have a conversation with him. Um, and really, he was just really candid about the situation as far as the extradition was concerned. So it wasn't difficult to talk to him about the extradition at all. You said that he was very calm. Did it surprise you at all that he wasn't um, more visibly upset or agitated? Not at the time. I, I really didn't take anything of it. I mean, I've done this for a long time, and every defendant reacts differently with these types of charges. I mean, he originally he, he was shocked by the arrest, were, were his words. Um, so, I mean, it didn't surprise me. I was probably just as shocked as he was that he was found in Monroe County. Definitely. You were probably not expecting this to come your way. I definitely, after I was following the case, I did not expect uh, Mr. Koberger to end up in Monroe County and be an alleged suspect. So the evidence presented in the affidavit basically is the DNA, the car, the cell phone pings, and the physical description given by one of the surviving roommates. If you were representing him in this murder trial, what would your strategy be? Do you think that the police have an airtight case, or do you think you'd be able to poke holes in any of that? Well, it's obviously going to be Attorney Taylor's job to poke holes in that. Uh, looking at it objectively, this is just the infancy of the case, and all we have is still the affidavit of probable cause. But from what you mentioned, if you individually look at each piece of evidence, there's holes as to each piece of evidence that's in the affidavit of probable cause. Uh, I've stated before that it's a strong circumstantial case, but with a lot of those holes. Uh, if you look at the sheath that was left at the scene that contained or had uh, Brian's DNA on it, that's touch transfer DNA. Uh, it's not blood DNA that we're aware of, and we don't know if there's more blood DNA around the corner. But as far as the touch transfer DNA, that just means that he touched that object and, and it could have went undisturbed for a long period of time. Uh, experts would tell you if it goes undisturbed, it could be forever that you would be able to recover his touch DNA. Uh, if we talk about the identification on scene made by DM. Um, I classified it as shaky at best. It certainly isn't 100% Mr. Koberger. Uh, and quite frankly, I think Attorney Taylor uh, will make that identification almost uh, unusable for the Commonwealth based upon my experience uh, due to the circumstances surrounding both the ID and the aftermath of the ID. Uh, as far as the car being in the vehicle, again, I don't, I don't know of any direct evidence that it's actually Ryan's car or that he was driving the vehicle. Uh, they're using circumstantial evidence and they're using strong circle circumstantial evidence to say that it was his vehicle at this time. 
Uh, but that all goes back to the cell phone tower pings, which are very unreliable. Uh, that any expert's going to testify that you know that cell phone tower ping, you're just within a radius of the tower that it pings off of. Uh, and that radius could be up to 20 miles wide. Obviously, as the crow flies, I think Brian was approximately eight miles away from the University of Idaho where this crime, where the crime was allegedly committed. So at any moment in time, any day, he could ping off of a tower that would put him within that radius. Um, so certainly there's circumstantial evidence when grouped together. It, it seems like it's fairly strong. Uh, but at this point in time, there's obvious holes and, and holes that the prosecution can close. I, I want to make that clear. But looking objectively at it, I mean, right now, it's a strong circumstantial case, but it, but it has certain holes that can a def, very competent uh, defense attorney like Attorney Taylor is going to make those holes big and, and they'll remain big, in my opinion, until closed. So this question I just asked, because of your knowledge and your background, there's a lot of questions and speculation surrounding the surviving roommate and why she might not have called the police for several hours. Um, but all that's laid out in the affidavit is the reasons why they arrested Brian Koberger specifically. So is it fair to say there might be more information that the police are aware of that we're just not privy to at this moment? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely going to be more that comes out. Um, obviously, we're not privy to the entire cell phone dump, nor will we be of all four victims as well as Mr. Koberger. Um, there could be a link between that's established between them. I don't know. Um, there also could be DNA evidence now as the uh, Pennsylvania State Police executed a search warrant on Mr. Koberger when he was in their custody. Um, so that's also very important so it could be blood dna that's linked to the crime you also have that uh, really speculation about the van's uh, footprint that was found at the scene i know there's been video and I, I watched the video too of the police coming to the party or one of the parties where there was a noise complaint where the person who answered the door had a van's a pair of vans on so really um there's a lot of work to do i'm not saying the commonwealth doesn't have more evidence that they're not sharing with us at this time but my whole intention and my whole representation uh, of mr koper was to make sure that he gets a fair trial and the only way to get a fair trial is to look at everything objectively uh, and really wait until the evidence comes out at trial uh, because that that's what an individual who's you know has that presumption of innocence is entitled Two more questions. Uh, did it surprise you um, if he did commit the crime? Did it surprise you that he would have left behind that leather knife sheath with his DNA on it, knowing that he is a criminology student? A comment on that a little differently uh, than what you want. But I mean, I'm a defense attorney. I know or I should know a lot about how police do investigations. I probably know more than Mr. Koberger on how they do police investigations. Um, so to say that simply because he studied in criminology and that, that makes it you know, a reason as to why he's a suspect, every defense attorney could also be a suspect. Obviously, there's circumstantial evidence that puts Mr. Koberger closer than me. Uh, but I, you know, I really don't want to comment on why the sheep may or may not have been left because I, mean, I can't really say why it was. Right. That makes sense. Uh, last question is probably the hardest, and if you don't want to answer it, that's okay. Uh, obviously, Mr. Koberger enjoys the presumption of innocence, uh, but after meeting him, after reading the affidavit, do you think he's guilty? I don't judge cases like that. I look and wait until all of the evidence uh, is brought out and testified to at trial. Uh, I know that sounds like a defense attorney uh, can can speech, uh, <laughs> but really I can't comment until I know all of the evidence against Mr. Koberger, and nor would I want to comment because again, he does have that presumption of innocence, uh, and you really the evidence doesn't come fully out until actual trial. I mean, certainly I, I anticipate tomorrow we're going to learn additional facts that are contained without outside the affidavit of probable cause. Uh, so I'm anticipating that for tomorrow. Yeah, that is absolutely fair enough. That is everything I wanted to ask. Um, 
anything else that you feel is important to to get out there? No, I, I, I've said it over and over and over. I just really, uh, the news media needs to be objective when they're talking about the case in general. Uh, obviously, we're not privy. No one's privy to all of the evidence in the case. And Mr. Koberger is entitled to a fair trial of his peers. And in order to do that, everyone must presume him innocent until they hear all of the evidence. And he's presumed innocent until proven otherwise. Yep. I just really want to stress that it's, as these cases become more uh, in social media, on the Internet, and people like to do their own sleuthing, uh, it's important not to jump to any type of conclusions and raise any biases about the evidence. Yeah.